Hello everyone and welcome to this fifth video in the Burst Education series. And today we're going to look at the anatomy of a research paper and how to quickly and efficiently analyze a study report, particularly with the aim of doing a review on the subject area, although the same technique can be repurposed to fit your needs. Now the basic sections of a research paper can be divided into the following. You have an abstract, an introduction, a method section, a results section, and a discussion. Now the abstract is there to grab your attention, and if it doesn't do that, then the study is probably not going to be something that interests you anyway. The introductory paragraph can usually be overlooked completely, because in most papers they simply give you a background of the condition, which, if you're doing a review on the subject, you'll probably know most of that anyway. The only line to make a note of in the introductory paragraph is the last line, which usually states the intended aim of the study. The method section should give you details on how the study was conducted. And what you're trying to establish is the risk of bias in the study. We talk about assessing risk of bias in a separate video, so check that out for more details. The results section should give you all the data about the outcomes allowing you to make a judgment about your confidence in the accuracy of the results. The discussion is again a section that sometimes requires less intensive scrutiny than others, but it does sometimes give you useful information about the author's opinion of the limitations of the study and its general applicability. So let's go through an example to see how I would go about quickly analyzing a study report. Now, we've, before we get into an actual paper, there are a few annotations which I use which I find quite useful when marking um, the hard copy of a study report. And they correspond to the main elements of a study. The symbols are basically a triangle, a circle, a square, and an X. And some of you might recognize those from a PlayStation controller, but essentially, the triangle is used to represent the population and sometimes that I divide that into three so you have the screened population, the included population and the assessed population. The circle represents the intervention and the comparator and again that's divided into two with the interventions and the comparators represented on either side of the circle. And the square stands for the outcomes. And again, you can divide that, subdivide that into different outcomes, depending on the study design. The X is used to represent any other points you want to make. And the four quadrants can be used and adapted individually as you see fit. So let's see how I would go about using this in a real example. So I use a Microsoft Surface Pro for um, for reviewing papers because I find the, the PDF interface is very useful allowing you to annotate uh, just by writing with the pen on the actual document itself. Of course you could just do this with, um, with a hard copy of the paper. So as we said in the introduction, if this is an included paper in a review, you know that you need to assess it in detail anyway. So the first thing that I would do is go to the last sentence of the introduction, which will tell you what the aim of the study is, which in this case was to, was to establish whether tamsulosin or nifedipine increased the likelihood of spontaneous stone passage, measured by the absence of need for further intervention, and if so, which is the better drug. So that's a fairly succinct summary of what the study was trying to establish. Then going on to the method section, you would have a read through the method section and highlight what you think are the important aspects which allow you to assess the bias in the study, what the interventions are, what the outcomes are, and whether the analysis was planned appropriately. So in this case, going through this quickly, you would have a look at the randomization method that's been used, whether you think it's an adequate method. You would also assess the blinding, whether the participants and the outcome assessors have been blinded. I use the X symbol to represent risk of bias, and there are different sources of bias in clinical studies. You could have selection bias, performance bias, detection bias, and reporting bias or attrition bias. But as I'm reading through, wherever I find that there is a potential source of bias, I will put a little X and mark down what the source of bias is. We'll talk about risk of bias in a separate video. 
but when you look back through your assessment of the paper, the more X's you find, the higher the risk of bias in your estimation. So in the method section, the authors state that this is a randomized placebo controlled trial with patients across 24 centers in the UK with ureteric colic. Adults aged 18 to 65 years with one stone of 10 millimeters or less at the largest dimension in either ureter identified on CTKUB were included. So you have some inclusion criteria there and they go on to explain what the main exclusion criteria were as well. So I would put in the margin here that these are population characteristics and if I was being particularly detailed I would state that these are inclusion exclusion criteria for randomized patients. We then move on to the details about randomization and they state that participants were allocated in a 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio to either tamsulose and nifedipine or placebo by a remote randomization system hosted at a remote center in Aberdeen using an algorithm with center, stone size and stone location as minimization covariates. Each patient received 28 capsules which were over encapsulated therefore indistinguishable supplied by an independent pharmacy who had no further involvement in the trial, ensuring that participants, clinicians, and trial personnel remained unaware of the allocated group. So in my estimation, I would say that the risk of bias for randomization, allocation, concealment, and blinding is low. And so I would not put anything in the margin. If, on the other hand, I thought that there was a risk of bias anywhere there, I would put an X in and state there's potential source of selection bias, which would then remind me when I look back later on that this is the paragraph this is the paragraph that contained my reasoning for uh, the potential source of selection bias. In this case, there isn't, so I'll just get rid of that. With most studies, the best place to find the, the details of the numbers of the included population is the PRISMA chart. So here we would say 4483 participants were screened, 167 were randomized, and the numbers that were assessed in each arm are given at the bottom. From this you'll get an idea of whether there is any significant attrition and also whether the groups are balanced. The next thing you'll find in the method section is the outcomes and you will try and think in your mind are they clinically relevant outcomes and also thinking forwards when you come to the results section you will compare the outcomes that have been focused on in the results versus the outcomes that were stated as intending to be assessed in the method section. Sometimes you might find that the, the outcomes that are focused on in the results are the ones which have shown statistical significance and they may be sub-analyses of different groups or even slightly different outcomes from what is mentioned in the methods and this again would be a potential source of bias. Going further along in the method, th method section, we have uh, details about the primary outcome. So the primary outcome was spontaneous stone passage in four weeks, defined as the absence of need for additional interventions to assess or to assist stone passage at four weeks after randomization. And other outcomes included pain and time to stone passage. Etc. So I will put my mark in the side saying that these are outcome data and specifically this is where the primary outcome is explained. We then have details about the power calculation. So the hypothesis was that the proportion of participants who passed the stone would be 10% higher in the tamsulosin group compared to the nifedipine group. And they calculated 1,062 participants with 354 in each group. And very quickly, you can look then at the bottom of the PRISMA diagram to see if that power calculation was met, which it was. 378, 379, and 379 per group, which means that I can also say that there is very low risk of attrition bias. So again, here I would not be putting an X in the sidelines. I would just leave it as I think is low risk of bias. Further, they state here, all participants were analyzed as randomized and subgroup analyses explored the possible effect of modification of stone size, location, the ureter, and sex, all using treatment by subgroup interaction terms 
and a 99% confidence interval, which further corroborates my estimation of a low risk of detection bias. Now the methods may state the randomization was carried out adequately, but table one, which gives you the baseline demographics of the included populations, will provide the evidence as to whether that randomization actually achieved its intended effect, which is to minimize the risk of imbalance of prognostic factors and confounders between the groups. So this again gives you important population data. And here you can see that most of the prognostic factors, almost all of the prognostic factors are actually very well balanced between the groups. Now the results section obviously gives us the outcome data and the authors say that 1,167 participants were randomly assigned and they were able to ascertain the primary outcome for 97% of participants, which is great, but there was a dropout rate at four weeks, only 62% of eligible participants completed the four-week questionnaire and 49% completed the 12-week questionnaire. So in terms of some of the secondary outcomes, which were assessed at four weeks and 12 weeks, there was a dropout rate, which needs to be borne in mind. And this is something that should be mentioned in the discussion and the reasons for the dropout rate, as well as the potential impact on the results. But the fact that there was a 97% return for the primary outcome suggests that as far as that is concerned, the risk of bias again would be low. So again, this is outcome data, so we would put our little square in there. And this is data on the primary outcome. Spontaneous stone passage during did not differ between the groups. 81% versus 80%. 81% in the Tamsulosin group versus 80% in the Nifedipin group and 80% in the placebo group. So fairly robust evidence in a large number of patients suggesting that there is no difference in the rate of spontaneous stone passage defined as the absence of the need for further intervention at four weeks in this patient group. And further, they state these findings were consistent across the predefined subgroups of sex, stone, sti stone size, and stone location. And as is usually the case, table one provides the graphical data or the numerical data to back up that primary outcome conclusion. And in this case, table two providing a good graphical representation of the fact that there really does not appear to be any significant difference between the groups. Table two here gives results of some of the subgroup analyses and secondary outcomes. And remember that we identified that there was a fairly significant dropout rate when it came to the four week and 12 week outcomes. So here I would just make a little mark in the side and mention a potential risk of detection bias because of that dropout rate. And remember, this is only pertaining to these secondary outcomes and not the primary outcome. And the discussion section of this paper, which is an extremely well thought out and elucidated discussion, which I encourage people to read if you have the time. It does make mention of this particular problem. And what they say is, the low response rates increase uncertainty around the finding of no effect for these secondary outcomes because of possible bias from missing data. But sensitivity analyses using imputation did not change the results. So they did do a sensitivity analysis and state that it didn't change their results. So it's now a judgment call whether you still think it's a high risk of bias or whether you would perhaps accept the results of that sensitivity analysis and not downgrade at all for risk of bias even in the secondary outcomes. And that is a bit of a judgment call. And so you get the idea. I won't go into exact details of how you do each step of the assessment of risk of bias and all the other aspects of analyzing a study in this video.
we can touch on those in separate videos. But the main idea is that you get a sense of which sections of a paper contain what information. And by just marking either on a hard copy or electronically in the sidelines where you find the population characteristics, the intervention and, out, uh, and comparator characteristics, the outcome characteristics, and the risk of bias assessment, that will allow you to very quickly go back to a paper and refresh your memory as to what you thought when you read it. And also it allows you to come up with a small one paragraph summary or a few line summary of the most important aspects of a paper and how you would summarize that to somebody if asked. It's fairly easy to, if you go back through it quickly, to explain your interpretation, which is that for adults under 65 who present with acute colic with a less than 10 millimeter stone single in the ureter, in a well-randomized, double-blind trial with a low risk of bias, 1,067 patients divided into three groups, which is an alpha blocker, a calcium channel blocker, and placebo. There was no statistical difference between the groups. In the rate of spontaneous stone passage, which was defined as the lack of need for intervention at four weeks in a trial with what we consider as having low risk of bias. So that's it for this video. As always, the key to, the, to these techniques is practice. So I hope you found some of the techniques useful and look forward to seeing you in some of the future videos.